Welcome to A-Level Chemistry. This is the first video on the Chemistry YouTube channel for the Sam Ellis Academy. And in the next 100 or so videos, I'm gonna teach you absolutely everything you need to get the best grade possible in A-Level Chemistry. Today's video though is electron configuration, isotopes, relative atomic mass, protons, neutrons, and the likes. The fundamentals of A-Level Chemistry. So to begin, let's look at atoms. What are they? What are they made of? And how are they structured? This here is an atom. If you have a pure sample of an element, for example, a chunk of 100% pure sodium metal, it's made up of just sodium atoms. These atoms are made up of three fundamental particles. Fundamental meaning they cannot be split or separated any further. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. In the middle, densely packed together, that is your nucleus. That houses the protons and neutrons. Around the outside of the nucleus exist the electrons. The electrons exist in these things called orbitals, and there's more on that later in this video. These different particles have different properties, charge and mass. They're the things you need to know about. The mass of a proton and neutron is very similar. In kilograms, the sort of unit you'd be used to, it's zero point and then 16 zeros, one, six, seven kilograms. That is insanely small. An electron is 2000 times smaller than even that number in terms of mass. The magnitude or size of charge on an electron and a proton is the same, and it's naught point and then 18 zeros, one, nine coulombs. Coulombs is the unit for charge, like kilogram is the unit for mass. The point I am actually getting at here is that these are really small. So it's an absolute nightmare to write them out over and over again. Therefore, we give protons, neutrons, and electrons relative masses and charges. We say that zero point and then zero, zero, zero onwards to 167 kilograms has a relative mass unit of one. And we say the charge, 0.18019 coulombs, is a relative charge of one. Therefore, protons, neutrons, and electrons that we all know and love have the relative charge and mass units as follows. A proton has a relative mass of one and a relative charge of positive one. A neutron has a relative mass of one and a charge of zero. The name gives it away, it's a neutral particle. We say an electron has a relative mass of zero. To be more pedantic, it's actually one over 2000 of a relative mass unit. And of course, a relative charge of negative one. Now that you know about the particles that make up the atoms, you can understand our good friend, the periodic table, much better. You see, the squares with the elemental symbols in them tell us about the makeup of that atom. The mass number, sometimes noted down as the letter A, is the sum of the protons and the neutrons. It's the number on top. The Z number, proton number, or atomic number, all of those phrases are interchangeable, is the number of protons inside the atom. An atom has no overall charge. The atomic, proton, or Z number is the same as the amount of electrons in the energy levels around the nucleus for a neutral atom. But whatever chemical reaction takes place, an electron is transferred or an electron is gained. So now you're left with one or more less electrons or one or more greater electrons. This makes an ion. An ion is a charged atom. And we note them down like this. You write the elemental symbol and then above the charge. Remember that an electron has a relative charge of minus one, not plus one. So gaining an electron actually means the ion is negatively one charged. Something worth remembering is the phrases an ion and cat ion. You're not explicitly told to remember these in the specification, but they do come up in textbooks and sometimes even on exams. A cat ion is a positively charged ion and an anion is a negatively charged one. Simple as that. Now this brings us on to something closely related to all of this, isotopes. You see, it's in fact the number of protons that determines what element you are, but the number of neutrons can actually vary and it does. This is very important because it's exactly how you end up with 24.3 being the relative atomic mass for magnesium. You obviously cannot have 0.3 of a neutron, but the definition of relative atomic mass explains this away perfectly. The relative atomic mass is defined as the average mass of an atom in a sample of an element on a scale where 1 12th of carbon 12 is 1. This is because, like I just said, most elements have a variety of isotopes that exist in the natural world. The number on the table, that is just the average. You will almost certainly have heard of carbon-13 or 14. It's the isotope of carbons used to date things like animal bones and dead old trees. The definition of relative atomic mass 
always comes up in the exam. It's come up every single year since the new spec was written, including 2022 when I sat my A-levels. It's worth two marks. And if you understand it, like I've just explained it, you probably won't forget it. Something else to mention is that relative atomic mass is denoted AR and relative molecular mass is denoted MR. You need to be able to calculate MR and it's not exactly complicated. You just add up all of the relative masses of the atoms involved. For example, this methane molecule has got one carbon and four hydrogens. You add 12, 1, 1, 1 and 1 to get 16, the relative molecular mass of methane. All right, now we've dealt with the fundamental stuff that was pretty much GCSE knowledge, we're going to move on to electron configuration. That is something new, and at first it may be difficult to get your head around. If you watch and watch again, I'm sure you'll get your head around it eventually. I'm just saying this so if you're not understanding it the first time around, you're not put off. All right, so this part of the course isn't great in my opinion because there's no explanation as to why a lot of this happens. You're just told to remember. That's because the reasoning is very far beyond the pay grade of an A-level chemist. It's far more complicated than we're equipped to deal with. So these are just sort of facts you have to accept for now. Our currently accepted model of the atom states that electrons exist in fixed energy levels or shells. The electrons move around the nucleus in these regions and each shell is given a number. These numbers are the principal quantum numbers. The further away the shell is from the nucleus, the higher the number. One, two, three, and four. You get the idea. Inside these shells, it's been proven that electrons don't have the same energies. And if this difference in energy state wasn't clarified, it would just be assumed that everything in energy level one is the same, everything in two is the same, everything in three is the same, and everything in four is the same. But that is not the case. So, the shells were divided into distinct subshells. Different electron shells have a different number of subshells. Shell one, or at principal energy level one, has one subshell. Principal energy level two has two subshells. Principal energy level three has three, and four has four. These subshells are all different, and they've been given four letters, S, P, D, and F. These subshells, remember, make up these principal energy levels, and these subshells can hold different numbers of electrons. Because of this, the different principal energy levels can hold different amounts of electrons too. Depending on the letter, a different amount of electrons can be held by a subshell. An S subshell can hold two electrons, a P can hold six, a D can hold 10, an F can hold 14. Why though? It's because these subshells are made up of something else. This is as deep as the iceberg goes. Orbitals. You need to know that each orbital can hold two electrons. If you think about what I've just said, S can hold two electrons and therefore has one orbital. P can hold six electrons, so has three orbitals. D can hold 10, so has five. And F can hold 14, so has seven. One, three, five, seven. That makes a bit more sense. The only thing you need to be able to do with this is write it down. And we're gonna do that now. First, subshell notation. Try saying that five times. Right, this goes as follows. Let's take neon. We've got 10 protons, so 10 electrons. We know that atoms always fill from the closest to the furthest away energy levels. So first will be principal energy level one. How many subshells are in principal energy level one? There's only one. Therefore, it's an S subshell. S has one orbital, so two electrons. Therefore, it is one S with two electrons. We write down one S two. There's still eight electrons to go. So what about the second principal energy level? That has two subshells. One of them's an S and one of them's a P. So it can hold eight total electrons, six plus two. So that's it, we're full. But how do we write it down? First, the 2s energy level will fill, 2s2. Then the 2p energy level will fill, 2p6. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 is the complete electron configuration for neon. Next up, to represent the same thing, is arrows in boxes. Arrows represent an electron, and a box represents an orbital. Therefore, we fill the 1s box with two arrows, the second with two arrows, and the third, fourth, and fifth also with two arrows. You'll never be asked to draw these boxes in an exam. You'll be given them to fill. One thing to mention, if we've got an element like nitrogen, where there's only seven total electrons, how are we gonna fill these boxes? Because two can fit in one box. There would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. But if we've got the box representation, how are we gonna do it? This brings something called the bus seating rule into play. That's where you wouldn't sit next to someone on the bus if there was an empty seat. Neither would an electron. It would fill the first box, and then the second electron would go in the second box, third in the third. If we look at oxygen, however, where we've got four electrons in the 2p subshell, you'll see that it is forced to fill 
the box that already has an electron in it. Something also important to mention is that one arrow must point up and one arrow must point down if there is two in a box. That is because the direction of the arrow represents a quantum property called spin. Again, no explanation required, just remember one arrow up, one arrow down. There is a couple more things to remember. There's two outliers to the rule of filling from the lowest energy level upwards, chromium and copper. And AQA in their infinite wisdom have decided you need to remember this. Chromium and copper donate one of their 4S electrons to the 3D subshell. So the electron configuration of chromium is 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 3D5, 4S1. And the electron configuration of copper, despite 4S being at a lower energy state than 3D, is 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 3D10, 4S1, because having 3D10 is more stable than having 3D9, 4S2. There's more on this when you get to the transition metals topic in year two, but for now, or if you're doing just AS chemistry, remember copper and chromium's electron configuration. Okay, we're coming to the end now. And look, I know full well that the electron configuration side of this video is a bit of a nightmare to get your head around the first time. But for now, that's all. I, and as always, I just want to thank you for watching, ask you to subscribe, like the video, and if you've got any questions, drop them in the comments. Our website has all the content of our videos in note form, as well as exam question packs and advice on getting into university.